This video will be about electric fields. So let's say that we have a charge of 100 microcoulombs, and we measure out a distance of 5 meters away from that charge, and we place a second charge at that 5 meters. Let's say for now that it's 20 microcoulombs. We can plug this into Coulomb's law and try to figure out the force that that first charge will apply on the second charge. Plugging these numbers in. So this is the equation for the force that that charge will experience. I would just have to convert those microcoulombs into coulombs by multiplying by 10 to the negative sixth. I'm not going to carry out that math. Instead, I want you to observe a pattern. I'm going to imagine now that I replace this 20 microcoulomb charge with a different charge. Just observe how the equation changes. So obviously there's now a 40 microcoulomb charge, so we would just replace one of the charges in the equation with 40 instead of 20, and everything else about the equation stays the same. And if I replace it again, everything else stays the same except for that one charge. And again, everything stays the same except for that one charge. What I'm trying to get at is that if the other parts of the equation stay the same, it seems like there's some property of the equation, those three parts, that are independent of the charge experiencing the force. There's some property of that point in space, just that one point in space, where no matter what charge you put in it, it's going to get multiplied by these numbers specifically. So scientists figured that because that one point in space has this property regardless of which charge is placed next to it, they gave that a special name and called that the electric field. So the electric field, capital E, is equal to the Coulomb constant times the charge that's creating the electric field, over the distance from the charge to the point that we're measuring the field strength at, squared. So those numbers specifically are the electric field strength. So the electric field is specifically the amount of newtons of force a charge will experience at a given point per coulomb of charge. The field points in the direction that a positive charge would be pushed if placed in the location. An electric field is a vector. The variable is capital E and the unit is newtons per coulomb. So n times c to the negative 1 means n over c newtons per coulomb because it's a measurement of how many newtons of force an object will experience based on how many coulombs of charge that object has. And there are two equations we can use, we'll talk about that more in a second. It can either be equal to k times the charge creating the field over r squared, or it can be equal to the force that a charge experiencing the field is experiencing divided by the charge experiencing the field. Again, we'll talk about that more later. We can imagine that here at this one point, the electric field is 10 newtons per coulomb. And if I plug in a certain charge and I want to know what force that charge will experience, I know that I have two coulombs and the field is 10 newtons per coulomb. So if for every coulomb this thing will experience 10 newtons of force, that means that this thing will experience 20 newtons of force from this electric field. We can now imagine that we have a negative 3 coulomb charge. And again, the field points in the direction that a positive charge would be pushed by the field. So because we have a negative charge, that would be pushed in the opposite direction as a positive charge, and so it's going to point the other way. The force on this charge is going to point the other way, and because it's negative 3 coulombs, 10 newtons per coulomb times 3 coulombs is equal to 30 newtons, and it, again, it's going to point in the opposite direction. So this is what the field tells us. It tells us no matter what charge we place inside of that field, the field is going to put this many newtons per coulomb of charge. So we can calculate the electric field pretty easily just by taking our charge, knowing what distance we're measuring from that charge. So here I have positive 50 microcoulombs, and I'm going to measure 10 meters away and see what the field strength is. And already I know that the field is going to be pointing away from the charge because it points in the direction that a positive charge would be pushed. And I know that if I placed a positive charge there, it would be repelled from the other positive charge. So the field will point away, plugging it into our equation gets me a field strength of 4,495 newtons per coulomb. This is actually a pretty normal field strength just because a coulomb is such a large charge. Once you put in regular sized charges, like in the micro range, it'll go back to being a normal amount of force. Here we can imagine that we have a negative 30 micro coulomb charge and we're measuring the field strength at eight meters from the charge. And here, because a positive charge would be attracted to the negative charge, and the field points in the direction that a positive charge would be pushed, the field is going to point toward the negative charge like this. Plugging in my numbers, this is the field strength there. 
So you can see that I use these numbers in two different ways. The first Q in that first equation is the charge creating the field, and the second Q in the second equation is the charge experiencing the field. That's a really important distinction as we move forward. Some problems will be asking you about a field based on a charge creating it, and another will ask you about the field based on the charge experiencing the field. When you have more than one charge creating an electric field, you can add the vectors together to find the total field. So just imagining that we have a positive and negative charge like this, and we want to know what the field strength is at this blue point. I know that the electric field would point away from the positive charge and toward the negative charge, so there are two different field vectors created by those two different charges. So we would say that the total field at that one point is just the vector sum of those two vectors, like this. So you can use vector math to find the strength, the total strength of a field based on multiple charges. Electric fields are to charge what gravitational fields are to mass. If you multiply the charge by the electric field, you get the electrostatic force, and if you multiply the mass by the gravitational field, you'll get the force of gravity. The electric field shares a lot of other common properties with the gravitational field. I'm going to link to the video we used last year for gravitational fields, just in case you've forgotten about that and want to review. Next thing to know about electric fields are electric field lines, which are lines that show the direction of the field extending out from the charge creating the field. And again, the direction is the direction that a positive charge would be pushed. There are specific rules for drawing field lines that we'll talk about. The lines must begin at a positive charge or infinity and end at a negative charge or infinity. Infinity here just means coming off of the page or going into the page from the outside of the page. The number of lines is proportional to the charge. If you have twice the charge, that charge is going to have twice the number of lines, and no two field lines can cross each other. This sounds complicated, but if I show you a few examples, I think it'll become pretty intuitive. Okay, so following these rules, I'm going to draw some field lines for each of these charges. First of all, I have a positive charge here, positive Q. I don't know exactly what that is. So I'm going to start by choosing how many field lines I want to draw, and I'm going to decide on four for now. It's traditional to have at least eight a lot of the time, but because we're just starting off, I'm just going to draw four like this. So these field lines, I've tried to make equidistant from each other, like at 90 degrees from each other on each side of that charge, just to make sure that the most area is clear about what the field is doing in that area. So these arrows are not showing the actual field strength. They're just showing the direction of the field at any one point. So basically what these are saying is that if you placed a positive charge anywhere along that line, the positive charge would be pushed along that line in this direction basically forever, which makes sense because that positive charge in the center would be repelling that positive charge away. So if we watch that positive charge move away, we know it's moving away because the other charge, the purple charge, is repelling it. So it follows the field line. The field line shows you how a positive charge would move in that field. So because I just drew those four field lines for Q, and I now have a charge of positive 2Q, if I double the charge, I should double the number of field lines that I use. I'm now going to draw eight field lines coming out of this charge, and it looks like this. And again, this is just showing you for any one point around this dot, these are the directions that a positive charge would be pushed away from that charge. So it's following the rules. They begin at a positive charge and they end at infinity, just going off forever in whatever direction they're going off to. And no two field lines cross. The reason why that rule exists is because if a field line crossed, that would imply that there would be two different ways that a positive charge could go from a single point. And that can't really happen. The positive charge is always going to go one very specific way based on the field that's pushing it. Now let's think about what would happen with a negative charge. Well, with a negative charge, the field lines show which direction a positive charge would be pushed. So the positive charge would be pushed toward the negative charge, so the field lines would look something like this. And this follows our rules. Here the lines begin at infinity and end at a negative charge. So those are the only two ways that field lines can end. They can't just randomly end in the middle of your paper. They have to go off into infinity or end at a negative charge. There's no other option. And this is because in an actual field, a positive charge wouldn't just stop moving after being pushed around for a while. It would either be attracted to a negative charge or just pushed away forever. And there may be specific points where a positive charge could theoretically be held still by two competing charges, but we don't really draw field lines there. I'll show you what that looks like in a little while. So again, this is just because a positive charge would be attracted to the negative charge and follow that path like that. Field lines are often drawn with multiple charges in the same location, so I'm going to show you what that looks like and how to draw those. Here I have a positive charge Q and a negative charge Q, so I'm going to start with the assumption that I'm going to have eight 
field lines coming out of the positive Q and eight field lines going into the negative Q. I have to keep the number of lines equal because the charges are equal to each other. I now have to decide how to connect these field lines, if at all. And basically what I mean by that is I have to determine what types of paths a positive charge would take based on these charges being present. And I can't be 100% certain about this, like there's no way to make these 100% accurately. You kind of have to eyeball it and think about what's going on. Starting with the arrow on the positive Q pointing to the right, I know that if a positive charge were placed there, it would be pushed away from the positive and toward the negative in basically a straight line. There wouldn't be anything to pull it up or down at all. So that's what that field line would look like there. And it obeys the rules. It must begin at a positive charge and end at a negative charge or infinity, which it did. Now thinking about the two vectors next to that first vector, we can imagine that if a positive charge were placed there, it would arc up, but then back down into the negative charge like that. And the same goes on the other side like this. Like it would probably be pushed away from the positive, but as it moved away from the positive charge, it would feel less force from that, and it would feel more from the negative charge, and so it would begin to be attracted again. For the rest of the field lines, we could assume that they just go off forever like this, because if you put a positive charge far enough away from that negative charge, it might just go on and on forever in that direction. Now let's try the same thing, but this time I've doubled one of the charges. So that means I'm going to need to use twice as many arrows for the left charge as the right charge. So I'm going to choose 8 and 4, like this, and now I need to decide how to connect these. Well again, a positive charge would probably be just pushed straight in there. And this time, if a positive charge were placed on those other two field lines directly next to that middle field line, the positive charges would feel a lot more force from the positive 2Q than the negative Q because it has a bigger charge. So they would experience that push away from the 2Q for a lot longer than they would feel an attractive force to the negative Q. So their path would probably look something like this. And for the rest, we can just imagine that they go off into infinity like that. So that's how I would draw those field lines specifically. Finally, if you have two positive charges like this, this is going to be a little strange. I'm going to draw the same number of lines for both. I'm going to start by drawing these two lines going towards each other, and this is what they would look like. One reason why they look like this is that electric field lines have to go to infinity and also can't cross each other at any point, so I can't allow these lines to cross each other. Another reason why they look like this is that if a positive charge were placed near one of those positive charges in the middle, it would kind of be repelled from both, so it would be pushed toward the middle, but it would also be repelled up or down, because again, it's being repelled away from both. So if it started just a little bit higher than those two charges, it would just be pushed away into positive infinity. And if it started just a little bit lower, it would be pushed away into like downward infinity, like that. The other lines might look something like this, where it still curves off a little bit because those charges are experiencing the force from the fixed charges. And the others might just look like this going off into infinity again. So again, these field lines really just represent the direction of a positive charge. They're not perfect. They're not a 100% accurate and precise way of measuring these paths. They're more of a visual approximation. Just make sure that when you're drawing them, you're following those three rules. The field strength between two equally and oppositely charged parallel conducting plates is constant at all points between the plates. I could show you the math for that, or you could look it up. I can't really go too deep into that, though, because it's just not really a big focus of the course. You do need to know that the field strength between two parallel conducting plates is the same at every point between the two plates, as long as they're of opposite charge and the same magnitude of charge. But you don't need to know the specific reason why. So if we looked at the electric field strength at any point, it's going to be the same. Like I'm imagining this is 5 newtons per coulomb, so no matter where I look, it's 5 newtons per coulomb. Because a constant electric field applies a constant force on a charge, charges in a constant electric field move in a parabola. So if I were to launch a charged particle into this field, if you think about it, this field is behaving a lot like the field of gravity. It's constant, and on Earth, gravity is a constant 9.8 down, and it's going to apply a constant force, just like gravity does, straight down on this charge. So if this charge is launched into that field, its path is going to follow the shape of a parabola. If you've forgotten why objects with constant forces down move in a parabola, I've also linked the projectile motion video from last year to review. But basically, this is another reason why electric fields are very similar to gravitational fields. And that's what you need to know about how electric fields work.